So, hello, welcome to EdQT 2017. Tonight, you, students, will be able to hear from prospective candidates for the USA Committee of 2017-2018. And hopefully, you'll get to see some fantastic and maybe ruthless debating. We've got a packed night with lots of eager candidates um, here ready to convince you of why they should be elected. So, without further ado, we will get started. But, just as a note, I'll say that there will be intervals between debates. Um, so you can go to the toilet, get water, get beer. Um, you're not locked in, don't worry. Um, also, you can contact us, as you can probably tell, um, on Twitter at Fresh Air News, or by email at news at freshair.org.uk, or on Facebook at Fresh Air News. But, without further ado, let's get on with it. Um, first up, we have the candidates for Vice President Communities. So would you like to both introduce yourselves and then we'll get started. Ladies first. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, my name is Ibi Curry. Um, I am a jockey student in my second year and I'm running for uh, VP Community. Uh, so my top five points are um, cheaper and more frequent, uh, frequent bus to all campuses. Um, increasing awareness of tenant rights, um, working alongside the sports union um, to get shuttle buses to and from campuses, uh, to help encourage more people to get involved with the sport, um, linking students to more sustainable volunteering and projects, um, improving the profiles of small businesses to Edinburgh students. Um, I've been very passionate about these type of issues for a very long time. Um, so when I did my GCSEs, I stated the green flag, um, award and we got our silver award um, for like, in my two years. Um, I took part in like a lot of public speaking on these issues. Um, I just thought that awareness is the best source of getting people to know about these types of things. Um, I volunteer currently with um, One Kind Charity, which is a um, small animal protection charity in Edinburgh. Um, and I am a frequent goer to King's Building, so I understand about the hassle of transport to and from um, other campuses. Um, I understand primarily that people are very keen to have change now, but I also understand that change is very much a fluid um, process. So it's all very well um, stating things that you'd like to see, but I have based my manifesto on a lot of things that are, um, are current and are being worked on, being worked on at the moment. Um, so that the, those foundations that have already been laid um, are then moved forward into the future. Thank you very much. And on the other side, we have. Hi, how's it going? Um, I'm Ollie. I'm a fourth year philosophy and maths student. Um, so I was going to Kings quite a lot and George Square. Uh, in my four years, I've done a lot of different community stuff, both through Edinburgh University and the wider community. So I've been the Swap and Reuse Hub's uh, community bike mechanic for two years, working on stuff like bikes for refugees and the We Spoke Hub. I've been working with Sex Expression for the last year uh, as a teacher, volunteer teacher, which is a sex ed charity doing great things. Um, I've done stuff with Fresh Air Radio, uh, my own show, and um, written for the student a few times. I've also played rugby and chess for the university. Um, in terms of wider community stuff, I'm currently running a debate club out in Wester Hales, um, long for now, and also started my own chess clubs that I've been running for the last couple of years. Uh, I'm also a founding member of the Edinburgh Student Housing Cooperative, which is 106 people democratically running themselves on Brunswick Links, which is really great. Um, when I saw the role of community being created, I thought it was amazing and great that you so were finally creating a role that was sort of about outreach and um, not only helping students and student community, but also helping the wider community, because I think Edinburgh University has got a great responsibility to do that uh, and its role in the city. Um, if I were to be elected, I would be using all my experience and passion to introduce uh, more housing cooperatives. Um, I think the cooperative model is great. I also want to improve tenants' rights and work alongside members of the Scottish Parliament um, on rent control issues, especially the new Tenancy Privacy Act coming in 2017 late. Um, cycling is a huge thing for me, as I've shown my cycle work, and I want to create uh, safer cycling um, with more bike security storage and more um, safety courses that can be available to students to make it less of a stigma to cycle bike. Um, in terms of, ooh, gone blank a bit. Um, in terms, mm, I think running out of time. Maybe a good idea. Yeah. Up there. Yeah. yeah. Check out the best manifesto online. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So now we've got some questions for both of you. So we'll alternate who gets to answer first, and 
you know, you have your allotted time. Um, and then after that, we've got some questions specific to your manifestos. We've also got some questions from the audience, so be prepared. Um, first up, I'll let Ollie try this time. Um, this is a new role with a new some this year. Do you think the University of Edinburgh will devote enough of its budget to position, or is there more needed? Um, as it's a new role, I mean, I'm not sure. Um, one thing that I'm really excited about is that it is a new role, so if, I were to, if anyone gets it, I'll be able to shape it. Um, and I would lobby very hard indeed that USA gave it the requisite amount of money that it deserves which I think with Edinburgh is considerable money and resources and land as well, how many buildings they own in the university, I think they've got a real responsibility to use those. For example, the Swap and Reuse Hub got a leg up from Edinburgh um, in its early infancy and now three years in it's doing great things and I think Edinburgh should be doing more of this. So, um, having much money was given, I would always try and get more for local community stuff. Excellent. And um, Amy? Um, I think the university has dedicated actually um, like a reasonable amount of money um, Funding. I think the um, the knowledge about this funding needs to be improved. So um, a lot of what um, zero for um, before 2040 um, is about is getting um, students more involved in like sustainable projects and pushing those forward. Um, and they have their, they have there is a, a dedicated budget and and grant scheme for that. So I think there is like definitely a budget allocated for um, this position. Um, but it's just improving the awareness and making sure people know that there are opportunities out there for people to get involved in and I think that's a large part of what this role um, is about and it's just making sure this budget that is allocated to these, this position and the possibilities for students is like make, make sure that people are, they know about it and have access to it um, in the best way possible. Thank you. Yeah. So we've got quite a lot of time pressure I'm afraid but we have got lots of questions to fire at you so I hope you guys are ready. The next one, um, you both mentioned the importance of students learning their tenants' rights in your manifestos, um, but how do you tend to raise awareness in an engaging way? It's not the most exciting of topics. <laughs> um, so I've actually spoken to a few students about this issue, um, um, as it is like definitely a very up and coming issue. Um, and, um, throwing ideas back and forth, oh, the overall, um, the overall like, idea is emails, which seems very basic, and it could be a, definitely a, a foundation part to that, um, the, that, the part of the campaign, getting people more aware of it. Um, but, I mean, it does, it seems very basic, and people are bombarded with emails, but after speaking to a lot of people, that has been the general consensus, that if there's an email almost headlined, these are your tenant rights, um, they, I don't know, that, that seems like the like general consensus that like, email should be almost the foundation to it, but then this year is about exploring new opportunities and new um, ideas about how to get that information out there. So I'm um, yeah, very excited to look into that. Yeah. Um, how are you going to get to um, well, yeah, it's interesting such as boring. I think one thing that is really exciting genuinely is, is the possibility of housing co-ops, a place where you can control where you live. Um, you, you know the one we live in, you can completely design the flats, paint them however you want. We're currently working on the basement. You can do lots of outreach with local um, community. There's no reason why we can't build more of those, um, which is something that students will become really engaged in. Of course, we also have to think about wider flat stuff. Um, I think some of the changes to housing tenancy rights coming in are actually exciting for people. For example, one big one that's coming in is that um, sort of infinite potential for length of contract. So no longer will you get kicked out for the fringe so that your landlord can make more money during the month of the fringe, which is exciting in itself. I think it's how we package that information for students. So as Amy Crady said, emails can be quite boring, but let's do stuff like workshops. Let's do interesting lectures that aren't that long, half an hour or so. Um, let's keep people engaged with hands-on information and they'll be more aware and more equipped for what is currently a landlord favouring environment. Okay, that's great. Um, we're going to go to our question from the audience. So, they are wondering, they said that community means people of all backgrounds. What will you do to support students who have to work for their rent? That's a really good question. Um, I'm someone who's actually had to work um, for my rent while I've been here, doing various different jobs. Um, hence all the mass tutoring and debate clubs and stuff, had to pay the rent as well. Um, I think that no student's grades should suffer as a result of having to work because it's a position that some students with a current loan system really have to be in. I don't migrate stuff in second year when I was picking up too many jobs. Um, I think the university has to be aware of that and not be passive and um, talk to students more and say, are you working? Not just the Edinburgh Award where you can go to it, but say, are you working? How often are you working? Let's keep aware of this. 
let's um, maybe give you sort of more time for exams or more resources. Um, and I think it's like, like in the form of a questionnaire, or would it be? Um, yeah, we've seen questionnaires can be. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I think questionnaires are a good place to start, or more advertising um, on campus. So, for example, um, are you so currently we say are you working to go for the Edinburgh Award? We could be saying are you working? Let us help you um, to manage your time, give you more resources to do such. Um, and I think personal tutors as well should also be aware of this. So when we meet personal tutors, they ask you how much are you working part time. That's just Edinburgh should be more aware of it, and then we're able to help. Yeah, as, as it happens, I'm actually off to work now right now. Um, <laughs> it's a shirt. Um, but um, yeah, no, it's, I mean, yeah, it, it definitely is a mass issue and it does get, get in the way of, um, of your, your work, as you like rightly said. Um, but um, as somebody who has actually recently applied for a grant, there are grants out there uh, to help students. Um, and they have been, the advice place was amazing with me and worked like as, as, as with a lot of other people um, and, and have worked like really hard to make sure that that But there's a lot of people that haven't found that the advice place has been good so would you introduce something new do you think? Um, I mean I think yeah I mean, if it's not, if people have uh, have critiques of it obviously then there's something that, that is there to be addressed um, and um, I think just understanding those stories and understanding how individually people would uh, would prefer to have uh, this, these issues being addressed is like very important. So I think it's a definitely an issue that needs to be built on, um, and a lot of opinion needs to be taken into account to then build up like the foundation of how to really address this issue. Okay, we've got um, another question for you, but can I remind you to be concise? We can squeeze in two more, please. <laughs> so we've got um, how will you ensure that your campaigns for lower rent won't hurt landlords? and particularly individuals, <laughs> rather than institutions. You've got Unite in Edinburgh University against, you know, your man around the corner. What are you going to do to make sure that it's fair for everyone? I mean, I mean primarily no one said it's easy. Easy. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. But um, I think that's a very valid point. I mean, I personally haven't looked into the issue because, I mean, I've looked into the issues like based for students rather than um, looking at the landlord's perspective, but obviously that's like a very valid point that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, but I think, yeah, I mean, I don't know much about the issue, but I would love to like find out a little bit more about it and make sure like it is evenly balanced. Um, and yeah, just better understanding about the issue is basically where I'm at. Fair enough. And Ollie? <laughs> um, yeah, I think we're talking about an environment which is very landlord heavy right now. My concern is definitely about the students' welfare at the moment instead of the humble landlord around the corner. Um, I think, you know, anecdotally, my friend in a, in a meeting, uh, flat viewing, there were enough people there, the landlord decided to raise the rent by 50 quid a month there and then. That's the kind of stuff we're dealing with right now. Um, I think that certainly you're right, like policies are important, hence the great new Tenancy Act is coming in, which I hope to work with MSPs to implement properly, which gives um, students more rights. I'm not trying to sort of like go after individual landlords, but certainly the system is very uh, favourable to them right now, and I'm much more concerned with um, building co-ops, getting rent, getting rent control, getting good rent pressure areas, and making sure that students are in an independent position overall. That's pretty good. <laughs> Next up, okay, we've got our last question, and it's again from the audience. So um, now here it is. Sorry, uh, tech problem. Uh, community role will involve lots of interacting and lobbying of uni bigwigs. Um, so how will you convince them on your key issues? We're going to start with Ollie. Um, I think because two things, one, my experience and also my passion for this, I genuinely really want this job because I think we can make a huge difference. Um, I'd be extremely prepared. Having, having been in various organisations like Co-op, I've been in many three-hour meetings, uh, thrashing things out through a democratic process. Did you get uh, Yeah, lots of vegan stuff. Um, but, um, it's cool, vegan food's cool. But yeah, um, I'm honestly experiencing many different paid and unpaid roles. Um, I'm aware of the importance of lobbying and talking things out um, and different viewpoints bringing those together, but I, I believe that my experience in that and my passion and dedication uh, for fighting for these causes would see through. Brilliant. Amy? Um, what I perceive the community role as being is um, making sure that the whole university is um, as like a, as a unit, um, and so like working with like liberation groups and sports union and coming at these issues from the university as a whole is really important. 
Um, like the university at the moment, I feel is very segregated, um, and so making sure like people feel like they go to Edinburgh University and are not just a part of one section, I think is a massive issue. So if you are if you are lobbying for these problems, but you're coming at it as like as with the support of the whole university, um, I think is like really important. So it's just building up uh, like a greater unity within the within the university. Um, and then attacking these problems head on with the back with backing from the university. Um, as like as well as this, like I feel this role is a fantastic opportunity, um, and like uh, it encompasses so many different things. Um, and like I feel like there is a lot that I can give to this, and I think that that will like come through when these when these, when these issues are there, but also backed up by by the university as well. Brilliant. Okay, well, thank you very much, guys. Uh, good luck with your shift. Uh, good luck in general. Um, and without further ado, we're going to end that debate. So. Okay, hello, everyone, and welcome back. We have got our vice presidential candidate for welfare sat here on stage. And as you can see, there's even more of them. So um, we're going to start off with the introductions and manifestos. Um, we're going to start from this end this time. So, I Um, I did practice law for 10 years prior to moving here, 
and so I'd like you to let my experience work for you. Uh, so I'm asking that you follow me on Facebook at Josh4BPW, and you can find me on Twitter at Mr. J Sim. Uh, and don't forget to vote Josh number one for BP Walker. Okay, okay, thank you. At that point, I would also just remind everyone that we are at Fresh Air News on Twitter, and we've got an email on Facebook, so you can email us too. Um, I've been assured that the mics are all working now, so we'll start with Lois, since we've kind of moved in this direction. We do have the loop or something, but everyone will get better. Hi, I'm Lois. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hey. Um, um, I'm running to be your welfare vice president because it's so important that everybody feels like they're included within the university community. And I know people say this a lot, but there really is a sense of everyone being scattered in different campuses and underrepresented groups um, aren't always supported. So I have four main goals that I would like to achieve. First of all, better counselling. So continuing to push to reduce waiting times and also to have follow-up group sessions for people that have been through the counselling process because at the moment there is no sort of safety net for them, they're just kind of um, disregarded once they've finished the allotted six. And um, I would also like to have better representation amongst counsellors, so having more BME, more LGBT+, more female counsellors is really important. Um, and the second thing that I would like to achieve is to improve wellbeing services so having more free sanitary products on all campuses and in female and uh, gender neutral toilets because if you're on your period and you're in the toilet, going through the advice place can be a bit of an issue. So, <laughs> true story! <laughs> and the third thing I would like to do is to have mental health training. So I know the uni today has promised to... Okay, so... Um, as well as that, I would also like to have better support for our liberation groups. And I know what it's like to represent students, and um, it's a huge responsibility, but also very rewarding. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, next up. Hi, my name's Matt, and I'm for BP Welfare. So, my commitment is to both a short and long term plan, each capturing my happy themes of inclusion, accessibility, and compassion. So, in the short term, I'll create a fully encompassing online space, bringing together student association services, uni services, and outside student um, assistance. So, this unites the existing services in a new and efficient way, which has an immediate benefit to students who simply can't wait for long term changes. In the long term, I'll be implementing welfare spaces across every campus in the university to make sure that everyone is included. So, this will include welfare first responders either trained in mental first aid, mental health first aid, or specialist knowledge of welfare services. So we won't be waiting until this crisis point to seek help, and making welfare an everyday priority. Studying is important, but our welfare is vital. Um, so the overall message I want to send is, I'm not offering you gimmicks, but real ideas for change, um, by changing attitudes and welfare culture across the university. Um, so those that need immediate help, while long-term projects are in progress, get that help, as well as making sure that any projects that I am going to warn you about time to stay on. So I'm not a candidate for the answers, but I am a candidate who knows the people who do have the answers. So I'm genuinely providing you with achievable solutions to critical problems that we should face. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am sorry, again, I will just apologise for any technical faults and everything that we've got going on at the minute, but <coughs> hopefully that sorted. Is that mic working? I think so, yeah. Hey. hey. <laughs> Okay. Um, hi, so I'm Kara, and I'm an international student from Southern California doing a, uh, a master's degree in literature and society. So my biggest concern with my vice president as well for welfare would be making sure that marginalized and underrepresented students are, the dialogues about those issues are becoming central to the entire university as a community. And the only way that I can imagine doing that is by having more information, because information is power. So one of the ways I intend to do that is with um, panels. And sometimes I think what gets in the way of allies becoming allies is not knowing what to say and being afraid they're gonna say the wrong thing. So with that information, hopefully, students can help each other and we'll have a better community for it. Um, that said, as far as platforms go, I, I am a postgraduate student, and one thing I realized is that postgraduate students are essentially uh, forgotten about after Welcome Week. We have the mature cheese, and that's about it. Um, and then, 
Oh, okay. All the things. All the things and stuff. Uh, last thing I'll say is that in my life I've adopted the motto, I refuse to be limited. As Vice President for Welfare, I do the same for the student body. Thank you very much. And next up, we've got Esther. Okay, is this one working? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Great, okay. Um, so, my name's Esther, and I'm running for your first ever Vice President of Welfare. I failed my first year of university, and that wasn't because I didn't like my course, and it wasn't because I didn't work hard enough. I failed because this university doesn't do enough to make sure that its students are doing well, whether or not they're struggling. Um, changing that means some major things, like making counselling easier to access, making sure that when we send our students on years abroad, we're not leaving them without any help. It means making sure that things like extensions and special circumstances are fairer and more straightforward. But it means some simple steps too. So spacing out deadlines, providing more student kitchens and study spaces so you have to pay five pounds for a nasty wrap from DHT. And it means, <laughs> and it means running STF Fridays where you can get tested on campus. Um, and I also want to work with students who face traditional barriers to education. I want to support our liberation groups for women, LGBT+, black and minority ethnic and disabled students to make this campus a fairer and more equal place. So, my name's Esther, I'm running to be your Vice President of Welfare. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Can we come back to other if you want to say again, or...? Yeah, go on. Do I have to? No, you don't have to. No, well, it's actually... Can you get getting... the students some questions? Yeah, sure. Okay, right, we're going to go through some questions. Again, it's the same idea, you get to jump in if you want to, and if you have something to say, we'll try and get through as many as possible. Sorry about taking that call. Um, so, first question is that this is a new position, um, and it seems like quite a broad one. Uh, so, what will the Vice President for Welfare uh, likely do in their role? How would you define it? What are components of it? Um, and which responsibilities do you hope to solidify for those in this role in the future? Ooh, okay, um, I should go. Yeah. Right. Um, well, um, the responsibilities actually include mental health services and gender equality. Um, as a part of my manifesto, I want to look at three components. I want to look at mental health, physical health, and sexual health. Um, now, obviously, mental health services are available for students on campus, but they do not reach out to all students across the university. Um, when I spoke to students, I found out that there are some issues which affect students across the university, and these are issues like mental health. Um, there is an advice place at King's Building, but I believe that it's not that uh, accessible because there are a lot of people who are not trained enough to uh, handle these issues. So yeah, mental health services, um, we, have to, we have to spread awareness about mental health and we have to find new and innovative ways to doing it. At the same time, personally, sexual health is something that I want to bring. Um, to, to the platform because it is something that hasn't been talked about. It is something that is underrepresented on a much bigger platform. Um, so there's sexual health, mental health, and physical health. Um, I want to work with. Sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I want to work with the sports union and the sports center to um, uh, put the, to um, spread awareness about the, about physical health and ways of um, um, generating um, more awareness about physical health. To relieve mental stress. Thank you. And um, also, just as a reminder, about the mics, try to talk directly into them, but just at the side. So if you want to reposition it slightly, hopefully. Um, right. Does that work? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, who else wants to come in on that one? Um, okay, we'll go with now. So, um, can you hear me from just shouting? It seems to be easier than <laughs> talking into this. Let's go with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So with welfare, forget about whether it's, you know, undergraduates, postgraduates, visiting students, it's for everyone. You know, everyone has a well-being and without your well-being, what's the point in studying? So as well-being vice president, the advantage that I have is I'm a psychology student, I'm just about to graduate. I have studied what's effective with counselling, the way the counselling service works right now, you get four sessions which have been reduced from six. When you're looking at counselling in the real world, they'll sort of tell you you need 16 to 20 sessions. The first six sessions is establishing the problem, middle six sessions is dealing with that problem, and then the end six sessions is dealing with what's going to happen afterwards. So by implementing these wellbeing spaces that I want to implement, having people, so these welfare first responders, having them available to help with mental health first aid, 
means that they're able to sort of take that pressure off the counselling service because being realistic, even though we've got this lovely 140,000 pounds that's going into the counselling service, that's still not going to provide immediate impact. So having these sort of well-being first responders and having these safe spaces to be able to go to relax, to feel that you can really embrace well-being, this is going to help, not adding an extra. Brilliant. Okay, um, Lois. So being a sabbatical officer, you're not working independently, you're part of a group, so it's so important to collaborate with the other sabbatical officers on issues because welfare can encompass a whole range of things. You can be working with um, communities, for example, um, community VP to help a student that's been unfairly evicted and is struggling to you know, find a place to stay while they're starting their dissertation. It can be a whole range of things. So um, the way I see it is mental health um, and well-being as well as policy diversity are the strongest parts of welfare that should be focused on. Um, we're going to move on to an audience question, if that's okay, um, and it's one that's been getting a lot of attention recently. Um, so, how do you candidates propose to tackle issues such as sexual assault and harassment on campus? Um, running campaigns isn't generally considered enough. Um, this has a lot of support on Twitter, hashtag at AQT. Just thought I'd apply that one. But yes, um, go for it. Uh, yeah. yeah, so... Um, one of the groups that we haven't really talked about is women as being underrepresented. Um, and one of the most important things, I think, to stop or prevent sexual assault is by bringing more attention, continuing the work that the Student Association has done already in the slogans they did this year, when they're saying no one asks for it, and the posters we've all, we've all seen around campus. That's a really good first step. However, there's more stuff that needs to be done, especially for people who have already been victims of assault. We needed, I, I tried to reach out as far as starting a small group, and I was met with the reply that, you know, there were too many boundaries, right? Um, but like I said, I refuse to be limited, and I think that this is something the university desperately needs. Um, How do you think you'll be in response to you know, cultural sensitivity and things like that? Well, you have to, I mean, one of, the, one of the boundaries, of course, is having a counselor who's trained for these situations and for these groups. The university I went to in California had 6,000 students, and we found a way to make this work. And so I want to use some of those tools to make another, like, whether it's more than one small group, but it's something that's needed. And if you look and talk to the women on, on campus, I guarantee that we can hold true. Just swim, yeah. So again, yes, yeah, the absent, sorry. <laughs> so again, coming back to changing the welfare culture. So this is not just about short-term changes. We're going to put up posters. We're going to do all these things. It's about changing the, the, the culture, about changing our attitudes towards well-being and towards sexual assault, not just for women, but for men. It happens with men as well. So it's about encompassing everyone in this um, and changing attitudes long-term so that when it comes to the end of our candidacy, because it's going to happen, these things don't just fall off the end and the new candidate spends the next four days like Trump did, deleting it from the last person <laughs> <laughs> and taking it off. Okay. Sorry to Trump okay. Point, <laughs> um, we're going to go with Josh and then Esther and then we'll move on to a different question. So. I agree with the point. I think the, the issue is um, that we need to see large-scale shifts. Um, we have victims who feel that informal support groups um, are more uh, advantageous than it is to go through the uh, support set up through the university. And I think part of that comes from the fact that a lot of us may face harassment from our uh, staff, our professors, our tutors. Um, and when this happens, we see that not only are we being victimized by them, but they're also the people who are in place making the policy uh, through which we want to try and remedy uh, victimization. So I think there needs to be a large scale effort to um, bring transparency to those proceedings rather than having professors sign non disclosure agreements. I think that needs to be uh, transparent so that we all know uh, who is responsible for what. Uh, so I think you've got some time there in the audience. <laughs> Yes, um, yeah, so is this working? Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> yes, I think that there's a lot we can do. Um, part of that is about awareness and it's about campaigns. Um, so this year you will all have seen the No One Asks for a campaign all across campus. Um, I think it's really, really important that we're seeing to be visibly supporting that and that we are pushing that message at every point. Um, working with societies like Sex Expression, who run their consent store at the Big Cheese um, and have gone out and run training societies. Um, I think it's really important that we support work like that. 
Um, as part of the No Aspirate campaign, we used to itself, or sorry, the Students Association, um, ran its own training um, session for society leaders and any student who's interested. So I think there's a lot of work to be done there, um, and I think there's a really big appetite for it, and we can do a lot. Um, in terms of sexual harassment, um, user, sorry, the Students Association <laughs> currently has a zero tolerance policy and it has done for, for years and years and years. So if you are harassed in the big cheese, you are able to tell any member of staff about that. They will be trained, they will be able to deal with that. Um, but that's something that not a lot of people know about and it's something that not a lot of people take advantage of. Um, so raising awareness and things like that, making sure people know, their, know where they are. Um, and I think one other big part of this is survivor support. Um, so at the moment, um, the Liberation Group is running a survivor support consultation um, into um, students' experiences, trying to find ways to better support them. Um, I think that, that is, it's a bit of a, not a mystery area, but I think that, that there is a really big need for that, to find people's experiences, to learn what that is, and learn how to best support people. And I think one part of that particularly is looking at um, the university and its disciplinary processes and complaints procedures. Um, I think in the past that's been really untransparent. I think a lot of people are very reluctant to um, take things like this forward um, through the university. I don't think that it's particularly understanding. I don't think that it's particularly pleasant process for people. And I certainly don't think that, that enough results come from it. So looking at things like that as well. Thank you very much. And um, we're going to move on to an audience question. Uh, so, what are your real ideas for change, um, Mel? And uh, it's just so. Um, and who? Sorry, excuse me. Um, who are the people that you know with the answers? So, what time? So, the real changes that I want to make, firstly, is so. I have a quick question: Who knows about the welfare services that we have at the university, really? And the biggest answer to that I've had is like nobody really knows exactly what's available. So making one centralised online space for all of these things to be provided almost like with little icons. Um, so that means that we have the knowledge, knowledge of power. Um, secondly, I want to implement things called welfare spaces. I don't think I've gone into that enough. What I want to do is have spaces across every campus so everyone can get access to them where you can go, you can get things like self-help guides, there'll be mindfulness, there'll be yoga, there'll be teas and coffees and a place for everyone to feel generally well and also I mean, have... Then you already have that to an extent. There's so there, there is a facility with chaplaincy, this is the point I'd like to come to. After speaking to people, I don't know if any of you have been to the chaplaincy and the facility that's there, but a lot of people feel a little bit alienated from that space because it's associated with religion. And although they do say that everyone is welcome, and they absolutely are, taking that space and making it autonomous is what we need to do so that everyone feels welcome. I'm talking about LGBT community, I'm talking about postgraduate students, I'm talking about mature students with families. Everyone should be welcome to these spaces, not just undergrads who are on central campus. And extending that, if I can, um, so that everyone gets a say as well. Um, what about these, you know, how will you approach and incorporate and encourage more conservative or um, students with certain religious beliefs and how will you look after them? Will you have specific welfare approaches or anyone? I don't understand the question, I'm sorry. Um, so the question is, um, how will... Oh, sorry. I'm getting a multiple questions now. <laughs> they have to be quick. Um, so how will the approach of like the welfare president help um, conservative students or students in certain religious groups you know, taking into account their beliefs and things like that, um, particularly concerning very controversial issues then, like gay rights or, okay. you know, yeah, I should. Um, right, well, I have mentioned in my manifesto that we have to find innovative ways of approaching people who are not really a part of USA, uh, Edinburgh University Students Association. Um, there are a lot of people who are not currently voting, who are not currently participating in a lot of um, activities that go on at the university. Um, I personally feel that the only one of the best ways to approach these people is to go up to them and have a have a one to one chat. Um, what I'm trying to say is that every student, you know, no, but what I'm trying to say is if we have to target certain people, we have to go out there and reach out to them personally. Yeah, there was um, particularly this recently there was an issue where a transgender student was kicked out of Big Cheese, and so there was. <laughs> an argument um, about, or not an argument, say, but 
certainly a lot of debate about educating um, the student association mm -hmm. staff. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think? It's a question from the audience. Well, if you don't want to, don't really have to, but. I think that again, it comes back to information. Like, the staff needs to be knowing about what, what, like, the gender policing is not okay in our bathrooms, but also that we have, um, you know, the binary bathrooms, but we also have unisex bathrooms. And so it's important that the staff know what's available and also that they know that's not okay. You can't be telling people what bathroom they're in, whether they're trans or not trans. People can go to the bathroom where they're comfortable. Being comfortable on campus is vital to learning. That's the whole point of the welfare role. So that's where I stand. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely just a minute. Um, I... Yeah, I was I was really appalled to hear that somebody, um, that a trans student, was moved from a bathroom in the Big Cheese. Um, yeah, they weren't a trans. Student. They weren't a trans student. Okay, I I'm still really think sorry, that. Sorry, but it's just the question I received. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, that that's interesting to know. Um, I still think that that is um, a sort of real um, worry that trans students probably have, and I think that. Um, again, when working with liberation groups, it's a really important thing to take on board, even if in this case um, that wasn't what happened. Um, I think it's something that has the potential to happen. I think it's really, really vital that we're making sure that our staff are trained. Um, I mean, I, I know of instance in the past in the Big Cheese, um, a friend of mine um, who has a disability was once refused entry because the staff thought that, that his like, physical disability was him being drunk, and it wasn't. And I think that, yeah, and I think that training like that is incredibly important. Yeah. Um, I would like to reiterate that this question from the audience, I don't think that's why I couldn't give you more context or anything like that. Um, I'm afraid we are going to have to leave it there as well because we're running a bit over time. But um, congratulations, good luck, and thank you very much. <laughs> that, um, now we've got the next debate up. It is the Vice President for Activities and Services. Um, before we get started, that question about the tweets, I'm afraid we can't have live tweets up on the screen behind us, but um, you can always go on Twitter on your phone. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so uh, just a reminder, we are at Fresh Air News on Twitter, if anyone wants to go on Twitter. Um, in the meantime, let's get started on our next debate. So we're going to start with introductions and quick manifesto speeches. And then we'll get on to some more questions. So, here we go. Oh, um, I'm Eve Thomas-Davies and I'm running for Vice President of Activities and Services. I'm a third year politics and philosophy student. Um, the main reason I'm re running for BPAS is because I, re I recognise that the student body, all students within the university, um, require a union that is accessible, supportive and representative of them. I'm a member of the Society's Council and I founded the Acapella Society. Um, I honestly understand the problems and the barriers that you face when setting up a society, running a society, and even being participant of the society. Um, and I know, the, I know that the, from experience that the policies that I will implement will make a difference within the society um, uh, forum. Um, the central, my first policy is um, the central booking systems. I'm going to create a, 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 a database of venues and I also encourage the full usage of user venues because at the moment there is um, not much going on. Um, there's a lot of free space. Um, I'm also um, want to create. I will create concrete links between the activities and the support system available for mental health. Um, the reason I'm doing this is because, from my personal experience, being part of a society um, and a community that you can talk to people about your, um, the issues you're facing. Um, really helps, um, and it also gives you an outlet for, stre um, outlet for strength, uh, stress. Um, I, I will work with the welfare officer on this because um, I understand it's a, it's a problem for their remit, but also uh, it's a problem that affects all, all parts of the university, whether you're community or societies or, or a, a volunteering group, it affects everybody. Um, as with all big organisations, there's room for improvement um, and I know that my experience and the enthusiasm, the enthusiasm I have behind activities, um, I can make a difference um, and together we can achieve more. Brilliant. Perfect. <laughs> um, next up we have... Uh, hi, my name is Kai. Um, thanks to everyone who's here and listening online. Uh, so I'm an international postgraduate student. I'm studying in a social policy. 
So I have over 10 years of experience in community organizing and student-based organizing, which I'd really love to bring to this role. Uh, in this past year, I've worked as the LGBT plus officer uh, for the Students Association. So that's included working with societies, staff, community organizations, uh, and the like for various events, especially highlighted during the History Month, which was last month, which we had a plethora of amazing uh, events, panels, and such. What I'd like to do if elected includes, uh, to make it easier to run your society, I don't think you should be bogged, back, bogged down with unnecessary bureaucracy, so working on things like room bookings and online money management. I'd also like to improve services, uh, that's really broad, and it includes things like making hot food more affordable, also making venues more accessible. I'd also like to connect societies better with the wider community, so this is everything from skill sharing to sponsorship to future employment, especially in the third sector. And finally, I'd like to make societies and the Students Association more inclusive. Uh, so this is especially of folks who aren't really thought of or necessarily who feel included now. So international students, postgraduate students, people in the sports union we need to work with more, uh, Kings, and various other groups as well. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to start off with some questions for both of you. And then if we have time, we'll move on to some specific to your manifestos. Um, so, you've both got personal experience, I mean Eve, uh, you were a member of the Societies Council, amongst other things, and Kai um, as an LGBT and an officer, if I am not mistaken. Oh, um, there was a tie there, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps you could tell us a bit about why you think that helps make you a good candidate. Yeah, we'll start with it. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, Eve. Um, so, uh, being a part of the Societies Council, um, I get through, we get all, through all the applications for societies, we get through all the funding um, applications as well. Um, I know the amount of constitutions that come through that have errors within them because they don't fit the use of guidelines um, is, an, is an issue of use because um, you haven't, they haven't got a template, prop, like a proper template um, for how to um, write a constitution and an application. Um, that's something I really want to address. Also funding, a lot of people don't actually know what funding is available um, throughout the university and user. Um, and so um, I'm, I, because I've been part of the Societies Council, I know where and which, which funding what opportunity is best for you and where to get it from. Okay, and how will you help people, do you think, to, how will you help people um, learn that too? Yeah, yeah. so um, I'm actually going to create a handbook of um, committees, for committee handovers <laughs> as well, um, but it will include all the funding opportunities, If you and, and also I'd be willing to talk to people and say, what are you looking for, um, what, is it for one event, um, is it for um, uh, kind of um, getting new costumes for ballroom dancing, for example, um, because there are all different types of funding, um, and if you're going for a sustainability pro project, then it's probably the university. Um, I would, I, I, because I'm knowledgeable, I would give my expertise to people. Okay, and Yeah, so I think uh, this year has been really great for me to get a handle of how it works internally in the Students Association, but also in the wider community. So in terms of societies, yes, I've also worked with various societies who have different levels and types of organizing and dealing with finding funding, uh, booking rooms, holding bigger parties, things like that. And so part of my manifesto is to help create collaboratively with the new activities reps uh, how-to guides on how to do things like get sponsorship, run panels, do larger conferences, and things so that not only large organizations will have that kind of information. I also think connecting with staff networks is really important. Connecting with this LGBT staff network is very helpful in spreading the word and connecting to people and resources that are already on the campus that societies can take advantage of. And then finally, in terms of connecting with community organizations, that's something that's very important to me to keep things in the whole Edinburgh community, not just in the university. Uh, there's skills, there's money, there's uh, future employment, there's advice that can come from these community organizations. And so I think the website needs to be edited and or created another page version where external organizations can navigate and discover which kinds of societies they would want to sponsor, which ones they'd want to link up with. Um, and I think that'd be really helpful for, for funding and for just general advice. Great. Okay, we've got our first question from the audience. Um, so it says the combination of activities and services is new as a role. Um, so what will you as candidates do in light of this to bring the two areas together? I'm going to start with Kai's. <laughs> yeah, so I think this is one of the most nebulous of new remits. Um, so I'm trying to work on uh, how to balance that as well. And I think so services, there's a lot of work that already goes behind the scenes in the Students Association with people that run entertainment. Um, I've met with people who are running the entertainment side of things, the marketing side of things, 
Um, and so I think my role in that would be more just finding out what students need and being able to advocate for that. And that can include uh, yeah, financial accessibility as well as physical accessibility to venues and services. Um, I think a lot of my focus, though, will be on societies and supporting this great work that over 260 societies do here um, in supporting the kind of long-term strategy of societies that USA has already been doing for a while. Okay, and um, Eve, what about you? How will you bring the two together? And please be concise. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. um, so uh, I'm going to create a society and club discount within the use of society, uh, use of venues. Um, I don't know whether any of you um, know about the Volkarev scheme where you get a card and um, you have to reach uh, 5,000 pounds and if you, if you do you get 500 pounds back for your society. It entices society to then go to, to Volkarev, go and buy food, go and buy drinks. Um, and so I want to introduce that to a user scheme because even though I know for the Acapella Society we're nowhere near that, but we've spent about 2,500 pounds there which we would not have spent there beforehand. Um, so I want to create that kind of system within the um, site, within the services. Also, I want to create um, monthly uh, open mic nights um, for societies to showcase their skills or to bring awareness to a, a course that they're trying to raise money for. Um, because I want to make real use of the use of venues that we currently have access to. Um, because this will in turn affect jobs of the students who are working here. Um, so hopefully, it will be a kind of a round circle. Okay. Good. Um, we're going to stick with you, Eve, and we've got a question now about your manifesto. Um, so, which events will make it onto your event calendar, and how can you hope to keep track of all the events happening, and how will you choose? Okay, so um, my live events calendar um, is in my manifesto because I, um, you know, for uh, semester dates you have to look at the university calendar for user user events you have to look at the user one but they don't always have all the society um, society events on there um, so you have to go to the society page and for a career service you need to go somewhere else it's, it's a huge amount of calendar that you've got to get to and I want to create that one central hub um, which will um, co uh, collect all of the data that you uh, all the information of everything you would go to um, obviously there is an issue with um, choosing events but when it comes to things about the university I it, I would do an application um, Thing with um, society so they can give um, give their dates, give their um, information about their events, similar to something like Sparkseat, for example. Um, with with the university, it will be what they already have on their website, same with the career service. Um, so, are you proposing a completely separate website just for societies and events, or no, no, no it's not. Um, it's bringing a. It's. It, I wanted to be under the use agreement. Um, and it brings together all the things from the university as well and, and events. So it will be events, semester dates, career service um, dates, just because I, it, I think it will make it so much easier for everyone to know what's happening when. Okay, and Kai, now you're my sister. Um, the how-to guide that you suggest um, uh, sounds like a good kind of way committee training and the committee members already get. Um, so how will they differ? So what are you going to bring to you? Great. Uh, so I think it's really exciting this new structure that's going to be happening with the activities representatives um, because I think there are over 260 societies who have very different things that they need from what a panel looks like, from what welfare looks like for them. Uh, and so that's why I say it needs to be collaborative with that group of folks um, to bring in basically the experiences that they've had in organizing it um, rather than it just coming from kind of a staff perspective or a more rudimentary uh, scheduled perspective and said, really, what does it mean when you have to throw a party when you also have exams going on, when you don't really know how to interact with the bar manager, when these things that are just new for 18 year olds who are running a society um, or people Maybe that are really focusing students. on new students mainly or ones that have already been here? I think that they will be mostly for society, so it'll really be whoever is running and working in those societies. So I think it needs to be accessible to people who, yeah, are new students, who are international students, who are postgraduate students, ways in which, yeah, we can talk about event throwing and campaigning that are, are more, are beyond just the, the basics and actually are specifically how does this, what does this mean for Edinburgh University? What does this mean for doing this at Student Association? Yes. I think um, the fact that the, the last two years of um, bringing together the activities reps um, is probably user's greatest achievement because um, it means that um, activities, uh, all activities from academics to music to um, volunteering groups are actually going to be properly represented and I'm really proud of that. Okay, well we're going to come back to you and your manifesto now, so you've got a bit more time. 
um, how will you encourage collaborative events that you've talked a lot about? Yeah, so um, uh, it's similar to the skill swap that currently go, is current, that's currently going on. Um, I want to forward that and face this a Facebook group where you try and um, swap skills within society. So that's only within the user societies. Um, so but will it incorporate all 260 societies? Or? Yeah. So I want I want um, it to include all all youth societies, all volunteering groups. For example, Acapella did um, a winter showcase with Maro, and we were supporting them, and we gave them half of the income that came from the event. Um, something like that, when um, you're giving volunteering groups the opportunity to um, bring your audience and their audience together. Um, so this would happen with the vet students, with the medics. Um, with people, of, as but they're like, obviously on different campuses as well a lot of the time. Yeah, um, but they all come to like Big Cheese, for example. So every, yeah, everyone, I mean, everybody, come everybody comes to Central, and um, I would create events within probably the venue because that's the biggest one. Because you've got two audiences, or even three, if you're going to three different parts of um, the university, bring them together and it will benefit everybody. Because um, we are one student body, and we should. Um, act like one student body and not separate campuses. <coughs> okay, and hi, now you're manifesto again. <laughs> you're being grilled. I believe. So, <laughs> how would you encourage reducing food waste, um, as you mentioned? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is not something that I'm bringing totally new um, to the Students Association. There's been some great work that's happened through the Buchanan Institute, as well as with Jenna at the BPS of this year, of how to already look at what kind of food waste exists so then we can figure out which ways would be most efficient to reduce food waste. So I won't pretend to be the one creating that complete plan. I think it's, it's already in the works and what it needs is continued sabbatical support as well as pushing that further through the university to not just be specific to use of services, but also the wider university. Um, so I think there are plans of how to... Would you work maybe with like supermarkets? You've already got these programs? So or would it be completely student-based? Right, so there are already services that collect food waste um, and find ways to either bring it to homeless shelters and people that need food um, or find like more sustainable ways to uh, dispose of that. So I think once again it comes back to looking at the resources that we have already in the community and being able to use those and connect them with the university instead of trying to create our own own new system. Okay, um, now we're going to get back to one more general question. Uh, so this is targeted at both of you, so you have a bit of time to think. But, um, we're going to start with Kai. Yeah. <laughs> what have you seen that you have already done that you were happy with, and what have you seen that you don't like about you, sir? They're right there. They can see me. Yeah. You this I really do. Um, yeah. So I I've only been here for this year as a master's student, but I've already been able to see a lot of the great work that you has done. Um, but I would say that in terms of societies and services, honestly, this activities rep idea is really key, um, and I think that's really going to be one of the, the greatest things that comes out of this year in terms of societies. Um, in terms of what isn't, hasn't been the best, I mean... <laughs> Choose your words carefully. Yeah. <laughs> um, hmm, that's a tough one. <laughs> uh, I think that... We can come back to Yeah, you. maybe come back to me. Maybe okay, we'll, we'll split it up that way. So tell us what's good, and then we'll go back to the name. Um, as Kai said, um, the activities reps, and as I said before, really, really good achievement. Um, also, um, to do with, as counselling is also a big thing in my manifesto, um, the fact that Skype um, counselling, Jess has been bringing back, and Jen has been bringing back Skype um, counselling, um, that's really good. I want to push group counselling as well. Um, also, the Pleasant's um, refurbishment are uh, amazing. Um, <laughs> uh, the rooms are really nice in there, the lighting's great, the, there's mirrors so you can dance and you can look at yourself. It's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what more do you want in life, exactly. really? Exactly. Okay, Kai, quickly, what back? Of course. Um, so I think this uh, is in my manifesto as well, or is in my manifesto as well. Um, so things around services in terms of accessibility, um, and thinking about that in a broader sense beyond just wheelchair accessibility, but even at that level, for example, the lifts and TV, you need someone to be able to open the doors for you in order to get into the, the lift. We're talking about making sure everyone can find out if there's fluorescent lightings or making sure that people who have sensitive ears are being like accommodated. There's several issues that are quite easy to fix. Exactly, right? just some more signage around that and some more yeah, infrastructure. Um, and then, of course, a, a issue that's close to my heart as a trans person is really being able to have gender-neutral toilets and making sure that issues around, you know, 
bathroom policing and things such as that don't They've become already issues. That in some buildings, they? Right, so there needs to be better signage around where they are, and, and I think also in Kings, for example, it's really not as present as it needs to be, and in order to access the gym in Kings building, for example, you have to go through a gendered entrance, and I don't think that makes sense for other people who are also non-binary, so those are kinds of the things that I want to work on. Okay, and Eve, very quickly, what have you here? I completely agree with that about the accessibility as well, really, really big thing. Um, for me, it would be um, applications, firstly for applications of um, societies. I tried to, I set up the acapella in my first year, and I probably was turned down from use about three or four times. Um, with my constitution and everything, um, it has become a lot better, but I want to make it a lot easier because everyone should have a society that they feel represents whatever they want to do. Um, also, for society events, uh, event planning is really stressful. Um, I have a part-time job in marketing communications and events, and um, I, yeah, I probably should be going grey by now. Um, the, yeah, I, I'd like to... Yeah, <laughs> so maybe, maybe I should be going okay with that, but um, the, the, yeah, the support for society events, um, I want to help them, help them run them, um, find the venues, find discounted venues outside the university, because finding venues outside the university that don't cost extortion amounts for societies that are small, it's, it's impossible. Um, so I, I will be debating, I will be, if I... If I get the present, um, if I get the role, I, I will promise I will get all the venues in Edinburgh to give discounted rates because it is ridiculous that you have to pay for a PA system on top of the venue itself. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you both very much. And good luck. of the evening. Um, we have currently got on stage our candidates for the position of education, uh, President for Education. So um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves again and you've got your minute talk. Um, since there are a few more of you this time, can we please try and make our response quite complex? Um, we're going to start this way and go that way if that's okay. Um, a minute to speak and don't forget your names. Hi there, I'm Ollie Parkins and I'm running to be your next Vice President of Education. I'm in my fourth year studying Civil Engineering um, and I'm running to make your education more sustainable, more inclusive and a higher quality. And to do this there are three main things that I'd like to focus on. I want to introduce free printing, I want to introduce an actual pathway to getting promoted as a lecturer through being a good teacher, not just being a good researcher. And I want to remove the teaching gap cap so that your postgrads and PhD students who mark your work have enough time to mark it so you get the fair grade you deserve. Great. <laughs> Next up. Hi there, my name is James Conrad Prokofsky. I'm a fourth year Norwegian linguistic student. A little bit about me. Uh, I was the president of the Linguistic Society and I'm currently the outgoing Currently, the outgoing sounds quite weird, but I am going to be the outgoing national chair of the Undergraduate Linguistics Association of Britain. Uh, as to why I'm standing, well, I'm going to use that buzzword again, inclusive is one of them, but I think that education should be inclusive, fair, and international. As to why, well, as you'll see on these little leaflets that I've been putting around campus, but also on each of the posters that we have around campus, I've got seven policies, and these policies haven't been plucked out of my head. These have come from students and staff across all schools, and I've been paying attention. Although I'm based in Central most of the time, I'm aware that the university is a very large hub. So let's begin quickly on to why this university can be inclusive. <clears throat> let's start with the first big important thing. <clears throat> Excuse me, I am a little bit nervous. I uh, hope you don't mind. Um, I believe, first and foremost, that USA should have an academic side. And at the moment, I think that although it might be a bit of an overstatement to say that USA is all about the big cheese and overpriced alcohol, uh, I do believe, however, that there can be more student-led conferences that USA can help to run. And I'd like to use these to improve LGBT plus and BEM visibility. I think it's quite important to make sure that students who have an appetite for certain things have the opportunity to have that platform. Also, we are in Scotland, and although I'm an English guy, I'm telling you this, I think that it's important that we showcase Scotland's languages 
And I think it's important that those, for example, who study Scottish history and literature Very have access to these things. As to why it's international, I'm afraid I'm the only person who's actually put Erasmus and EU funding as one of the main policies. We don't just need to lobby and campaign, we need to confront the university now. Brilliant. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there, I'm afraid. And next up. Um, hi there, um, my name is Guy Darge. I'm a fourth year social anthropology student and I'm running for a VP. Um, I was a tutorial and class rep in my first and second year and have been writing for the student newspaper for four years and this past year have been the art editor. In this capacity, we deal a lot with um, student issues, particularly on education and some of the, the, the problems that people have been having with it. Um, um, as a social anthropology student, my degree is about trying to understand other people, their desires, and how, you know, how they want to be perceived by others. And um, I spent a month um, before this going around talking to people about what they want to see um, improved education. And um, the main point that came up was diversity within teaching. We need to restructure our reading lists to include a variety of cultural perspectives as well as making it gender equal as well. I think at the end of um, courses, we should have quite, the questionnaires should relate to these issues as well, so there should be questions on diversity and questions on gender equality to make sure that uh, specific schools are internalizing feedback from students on this. Um, and I also think there should be a support network in place for people who have felt lectures are being insensitive or um, a, bit, a little bit brazen about cultural issues. Um, another point I'm uh, going, um, espousing is stricter guidelines for personal tutors. Um, consequences for PTs who don't um, meet their uh, pupils uh, twice a semester. And, um, questions about um, how they're socially getting on as well as just academically. Um, I also want to increase study spaces um, to make sure that places like King's and stuff have greater um, computer labs and also that uh, open access is available for all of George Square and there's no in access to buildings. Thank you. That's brilliant. Okay, yeah. Yes, everyone's got so much to say. Sorry. Um, we're on to our penultimate candidate. Um, hi, so I'm Bobby. I'm a fourth year math student and I have a lot of experience related to this school. So first of all, I've been school convener at the math school for two years and I've participated in two teaching programme reviews, one for the English school and another for the veterinary sciences school. Furthermore, I'm going to be an ELA member this year, which means that sim simultaneously to this role, um, I'll be reviewing Scottish, Scottish institutions so I can bring their good uses of practice back here to Edinburgh so that we can, um, so that we can flourish uh, as a university. Um, I also feel it's important that schools communicate with one another so that again we can grow as a unit and not as an association of independent schools. In order to do that, I think my main policies are transport. I'm a King's Building student. Um, I've experienced the shuttle bus for four years, um, so it's quite an important thing for us. I also think that a big thing for me is revision. Um, so in semester one, there was only actually four days between the end of term and the start of revision period. That's not long enough for students to revise. So I want to implement two new policies to relieve the stress and pressure of students during this time. Great, thank you. And our final candidate. Hi guys, my name is Barbara. I'm a fourth year neuroscience student here. And basically, um, similar to some of my other candidates here, I've been a uh, class rep 18 times over the past four years at Edinburgh. I've also been a school convener and a vice convener, so it's come from an academic representation background very strongly. Um, some of the things kind of what I've been wanting to push for is my main aim of the game is to have an academic kind of institution that based, that's based around you, that is focused around you and your studies and your commitments, not making you guys having to work extremely hard where you're grounded to the ground, but in fact an academic that motivates you. An, ac an, academ an academia where in fact that it helps you, that inspires you. So that's something that's a big thing this year. What I'm wanting to push on mostly is to help a lot of international students, undergrads, postgrads, and work with every single one of them to ensure that their academ academia is the best for them, that it helps them, and not to be in fact stigmatised or forgotten about, but in fact everyone together has that enjoyable experience of learning and studying at Edinburgh. Some of the other stuff that I'm also wanting to do is kind of work a lot on STEM this year. I believe especially women in STEM aren't very representative and being in a male dominated subject as well. A lot of women are so, have been very, very contributing to sciences, especially in maths and whatnot. And that's something that's a very big thing for me that I'd like to work on. Again, some of the things such as academic societies has been a huge thing for me too. 
being part of the biomedical societies, we've had a lot of talks and stuff. But there's more to do it there. There's things like USERA, um, USERA that are sold in academic research institutions, things like the societies of STEM as well. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to stop. Right. So that's a lot of support for them too, so that's why I'm running. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, so we're going to start off, as usual, with some general questions. Um, I know you guys have got loads of really great ideas, that's very evident, but there's also loads of you, so please <laughs> try and just get your ideas across as quickly as possible so we have as many questions as possible. Um, we're going to start off, we'll go the opposite direction this time, if that's okay. Um, so, study phase is an ongoing issue um, in many of your manifestos, you mention it actually. So how and where do you plan to increase study space at the university? Sure. Um, study space is, a, I mean, it's a, it's a big thing. And I can give, for example, my school. So currently as a school convener for biomed, I actually had no study spaces when I came to Central in third year. In fact, it was completely cracked and broken down and there wasn't even any, you know, there was nothing there at all. So, I mean, I really, really pushed my school hard and we got it renovated. There's so much more study spaces available that we have to fight for. Stuff that's like now, that's for example, Hugh Robson's 24 hours, the library's becoming 24 hours now, but Hugh Robson isn't going to become 24 hours anymore. I think this is something that we have to ask the students in each and each respective school, where do you want study space? For example, I've heard students from economics saying that they don't have any study spaces or any social spaces for them to kind of, you know, obviously do their work and stuff. And so we need to listen to our students, I believe, and I believe that that's the best way. We have to ask them where, why, and what you want. Um, there's other places as well in the uni that we have to look into, so yeah. Great, thank you. Bobby? Um, yeah, I agree. Like, one of the things in my manifesto is schools communicating with one another. I feel as though there's a lot of study space out there that isn't being utilised, especially in the King's buildings. I went to, so I actually yesterday just discovered a biology lab one floor down from me. There must have been 80 what computers in there. <laughs> yeah, 80 <laughs> computers that were completely free and not being used. Yeah, I hear about students who are complaining that they can't find a computer in the central library to study at. And while I see that it's a little bit more inconvenient to go out there, these, these um, facilities can't be utilised. Um, another thing is um, that I want to create a chill hub and central hub in every single school. So the math school actually has one of these and there's a bookable room, a place for um, informal study and then just a, a bit of a relaxing room just so that students can study together um, as well as independently. It's really hard to get students out. <laughs> yeah, it's quite a busy. Um, so I think one of the big problems is pin access and it's something I feel very strongly about. I believe for your own schools you should never have to have pin access, you should just get immediate access to your school with your student card. This puts a lot of particularly younger undergrad students off going there because you have to apply for it. It feels a little bit like you don't belong. You know, if it was just um, a simple tap-in, tap-out system at the library, people would use the study space in their own respective schools far more. I also believe that the library is the place that everyone wants to study. And we need to look at uh, the logistics of moving some of the, um, the facilities in the library to other buildings around campus and just making more block study space in the library. So for instance, you know, um, there's extension ideas going on for TV. I think we can move, um, move other departments out of the library, perhaps even the archives, and just replace all the study space. For a uh, university with 30,000 students, we are far trailing behind places like Aberdeen and Glasgow in the amount of study space we have available. So. Okay. Um, James, do you think it's more an issue of dispersion or is it we need more? Let's not kid ourselves. A study place does exist since university. The problem is it's just you don't know it. Let's take David Hume Tower as an example. I've gone in there several times over the semester and seeing empty rooms not being used and not being advertised and seeing that as a bit of an insult when we're told, for example, that for example, even postgrad students are having to desk share to have access and people are paying money to do research. I don't really understand exactly what the university's intention is with this, and so I think that we have to realise that. But surely postgrad and undergrads should have the same. They should have exactly the same, but the problem is I'm trying to illustrate here that the space definitely does exist. And it's basically just making sure that it's advertised and that that's the first and foremost primary thing here. And I think on the topic of postgrad, if I can just have a quick diversion because I didn't get that in in the beginning. Um, yeah, that very is the, very, very quickly. <laughs> Workspace is an issue. It's not always the case across school. It's very lopsided across all schools. So I'm of the opinion that we need to make sure that each school has the same provision of workspaces for postgraduate students, both research and taught. And, well, yes, I would agree with everyone else that 
there is a lot of study space that exists, but people don't necessarily know about it, especially down at King's. There's a lot of spare desks that people just don't know about. So we do need to focus on making sure that the study space is advertised to first years when they come in. But also, I think we do need to increase the amount of study space that we have available at Central. The library is going to be 24 hours, which is great, but as been said, Hugh Roth is going to be closing. So we, I think we need more 24 hour study space, more signposted computers. And I think as students associations such as TVET, people do study here, but I think we can make them more of an actual study space. Okay, um, we've got another question, and I'm going to let you kind of jump in as and when you've got a response. Um, but if you start overlapping, then I'll just like, be me and I'll take you again. Um, so, the question is, <laughs> there are pledges such as overhauling the uh, international office and campaigning to maintain EU funding. To what extent do you, um, could you as SABs um, actually implement these promises? Yes, go on. Okay, uh, EU funding Erasmus. Okay. Uh, I, I don't have anything specific on the international office, but I will say this. Um, we have a policy in place with you, sir, and it's fantastic. Or you, sir, the Students Association, as you're calling it. Sorry. Sorry, all the time it's done. Oh, okay. yeah, <laughs> um, but you have to, yeah, let's realise, um, you know, this is Scotland, it's Scotland's, this is Edinburgh's Scotland's capital city. And it's shocking that although we have a policy in place, the Students Association is also a pressure group. We shouldn't just be lobbying, we shouldn't just be campaigning, we need to confront both the university, the Scottish Government and the Westminster Governments to get an actual answer as to whether we can keep Erasmus, whether we're going to have to pay more to have access to Erasmus. The issue right now is that we, by having spoken to, uh, to staff in the School of Literatures, Languages and Cultures, they are not really assured by that policy and there needs to be more direct contact. Uh, I'm, as a person who's used Erasmus and a person who wants to make sure that the University of Edinburgh remains an international and inclusive place to study, seeing this kind of threatened, um, whether or not USA has a policy in place for student association, sorry, whether or not that is the case, we need you to have this. Say I should say that. But, <laughs> but whether, whether we have this in place or not, we need to have yeah. an actual response on paper, and that needs to happen now. Yeah, I mean, particularly in like Brexit and everything. Well, yeah, I mean. Listen, ed ed education is a devolved power, so we need to be uh, directing these questions at the Scottish Government. Um, the problem right now is that we're hearing different things from the Sc Scottish Government and Westminster Government about what Fresh is going to mean. And um, we're hearing different things from Westminster. I think the there's idea. A lot of yeah, there's a lot of uncertainty, but I think um, we can try and push to get some form of guarantee from the Scottish Government, or at least um, a guarantee that there will be subsidies um, in place post Brexit if EU funding is withdrawn. And what about, I mean, we don't just have programmes within Europe, it's not just Erasmus, you know, people get sent to Australia, they get sent to America, Russia, James? Sorry, I, I really want to butt in though, because in many d degrees, a third year abroad is a compulsory part of the degree, and we have top-notch research going on in languages, you may not see it, but it happens, and if we lose that third year, or for example, students have to pay more to have access, for example, if we have the same status as Kazakhstan, as a member of the Erasmus scheme, that is going to restrict us Violently, I, I, I really think it's important for us to realise just how vital it is we keep the deal as it is now, and we have that in writing from the government here in Scotland and also from the university. Okay. Take over that on that point yeah. as well. Actually, I feel like you know the fact is that a whoever does get the position has to have a strong foot in the hold that yes, we need to keep this fund and keep it on going. I don't think it's fair for us to decriminalise obviously our European students and students who come from abroad and. I totally agree with all the rest of the kind of our, our candidates here as well. That you, you know, with, especially with our funding and with a lot of kind of research that's going on talking about research. I read, um, I'm sure all of you were aware that there was an article recently published where we'll be written about a third of our research funding due to Brexit. And um, like, this doesn't just obviously impact our European students, but us as well. It kind of impacts our research projects, for example, that we're doing, and our students, especially in sciences, etc. I mean, just um, to enhance this, but for everyone. Um, and this is something that whoever gets the role has to implement and put the foot in the door and has a clear stance that look, you know, you guys have to commit yourself, the university has to commit to our students. If you're so hell bent on having international students come through the door, support them too. Okay. And um, we're actually going to move on to another group of students that often feel kind of uncertain or alienated in the university, and that is Kings. That's come up a lot. So, what are you going to do to help include and encourage Kings build, building students? Sorry to, you know, 
come to Central more often, get involved with the rest of the university? Yeah. Um, so one of my, one of my big um, priorities is peer support schemes, and lots of these schemes are already in place. And they make sure that students from King's Building Central or the other campuses get together and have trained together. But I want to implement even more peer support schemes that actually, that actually be interdisciplinary so that students <coughs> studying sciences can learn from our students, students studying veterinary medicine can learn from sciences students. And I think these peer support, peer led schemes would be a great way to do this. And this will also integrate postgrads and undergraduates even more. Um, <coughs> another thing would be to improve transport links. Um, the 41 shuttle, shuttle bus trial is great, but it needs to be expanded and also out for veterinary Expanded campus. or just continued indefinitely? It needs to be continued indefinitely and also the times need to be expanded. It doesn't even cover the rush hour. And also for the 67 bus, I went out to East the Bush a couple of days ago and it took such a long time to get there. And that bus service just needs to be improved. So I think better transport links and better, better um, peer support schemes. Okay. I mean, yes, these people also, remember, are voting for you, so... I think there also has to be the other way around. I think we should also be encouraging central students to go to Kings to study as well. It's actually, there's a lot of study spaces there. I think they do need to be improved, for sure. I think there needs to be more social studying spaces rather than, you know, quite formalised desks and, mm -hmm. and, and, and computer but study. Like these chill hubs or Yeah, something. exactly. I mean, I think that's a very good point from Bobby. I think there needs to be, um, you know, social studying in both places. And there needs to be a pool, there needs to be advertised. Um, any staff that has on central as well, you know, you can go to King's during study school. So not just within the science yeah. campus, maybe? I think, yeah, it's, you know, it's a great campus as well, I think everyone forgets it. it's actually a very nice place to go. I might go now! <laughs> yes! It's apparently <laughs> you're yeah. <I> really <laughs> Yes, Bobby. <laughs> uh, yeah, so just touching up on the same things really, um, it's really important that also that King's, King's students don't just have to come to Central, that we try and get Central students out there to utilise these study spaces and with the more effective transport system I feel like we'll see that a little bit more. Um, I do think it's um, necessary to get more frequent buses, I just think that um, we need to have a look at the timetable and maybe rearrange it more effectively. So, for example, take buses from between, um, like between le when lectures are going on, and maybe just put them at peak time. So this wouldn't increase the cost. So you don't want to leave students stranded. No, of course not. Well, yeah. So mm -hmm. again, the forty-one pilot will hopefully um, overcome that. Also, not just um, for students to integrate during education but also through sports and societies and activities and one of the pledges was to have Wednesday afternoons free of compulsory classes to allow students to mix with one another um, outside of the ends. Yeah, exactly, um, in sports and societies, so yeah. Okay. yeah. And I feel like what, another thing that I really wanted to push for was a community in Kings as well. Uh, currently I know for a fact that, you know, being between King, Central and the Royal Infirmary up in the top between our three campuses a lot of the time. I feel like building a community in the Kings is a big thing as well. Currently everyone's doing their own thing in Kings. There's not much of a community going on. There's not much outreach either. And we've all heard that before. So having an outreach from Kings from many different societies and services and whatnot there at Kings is a big beneficial point. And talking about transport as well. Having something that I really wanted to campaign on was um, not just transport, but getting to and from Kings during the night. I've also had to study at Kings late night at 12, 1 o'clock in the morning because of deadlines, etc. And it's not safe to go out there by yourself. I personally experienced that myself, and I feel like other students might feel the same too. Particularly so, if buses run out. Particularly if buses run out. And even though we knew we had a token scheme in place at Kings, it's not there anymore. So I think we need to really push on that and think. What should we do and how can we get students to and from King safely? There's a lot of areas around where Kings that I hope path that isn't even lit, like towards down the roads. And it's something that I really want to push for this year to make sure the safety of people come first, the safety of our students come first, that those study at late night during King can get to and from King safely. Yeah, very important point. Um, we're going to move on to a different question for Fred. Um, it's actually concerning your manifesto, Ollie, but any one of the candidates is welcome to kind of come up with their own response, obviously, because the audience would like to know um, how you're going to make free printing sustainable. Yeah, I mean, that's, that is a very good question. Um, and for me, I would say that sustainability is not just about the environmental impact. It's also, you know, it's also about being inclusive. 
um, of students need to be able to print and a lot of students just can't afford it. But with this free advert funded printing that I'm proposing, um, it means that you know, any student will be able to print out the coursework they need. And then, even though, yes, there is an environmental effect of printing, it will be sustainable overall because the students from low income backgrounds who can't access printing necessarily at the moment will be able to. Yes, and um, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, we want to know whether you guys think it's viable. I mean, it costs money for a reason, doesn't it? I totally agree. I think, you know, if, to be honest with you, I, I don't know with humanities, but I've, I've seen, especially with King's, it's really difficult for us to assign subjects because we have to do a lot of printing for, for example, we have to print all the different presentations. <laughs> 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 A lot of people have to do a lot of printing up for graphs and stuff, and it's a lot of hard work and effort. And I know that even though there was a policy or a, a, a implemented last year about you know ending the physical handouts, that's still not been the case in a lot of schools, and especially in my school. So do you think then maybe printing's becoming obsolete? We're in this digital era. We are getting there. Yeah, let's get some getting other voices yeah. if that's all right. I think that it's not obsolete. We'll come to you next. You, you, you know, there's times where you do need to print things. Also, sometimes reading um, on a computer it's very bad for your eyes and. People actually do prefer to do it. I think I'm not sure if we can, you know, I don't know how cheap it is to have free printing, but um, I, I certainly included my manifesto and um, I started talking about kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of per year. And each year you get five pounds, don't you? You're not each year, your first no, year. Your first year, which is, I wanted that to scale up to ten pounds pound every year. You know, this university earns more than every other Scottish university to put together. Um, it, it, it's not like you can afford something like ten pounds every year for other students. And what about international students? So, yeah, um, James first and then Bobby. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't think I necessarily disagree with any of this. It's just about the strategy, really. Uh, at least my subject uh, that I've been taking over the course of a four-year degree, it's fantastic now that they are phasing out actual physical printing and now we can do more online and my ed uh, forms of printing. But when we prove that, of course, we have to provide printed copies, um, I don't understand, for example, why it is that we necessarily have to even go through the printing system. I very happily go to the office where I have to hand in the, print, the printed document and ask them to print it out for me. I don't understand if they're that desperate to have a, a printed copy. Otherwise, I don't really understand why else we shouldn't be able to basically do the most sustainable option, that is to make sure it's uploaded electronically. But what if there's an electronic copy? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, I kind of left you with that and I'm yeah, like, yeah, sorry, yeah. I don't get a chance to answer, but Bobby, I'm afraid we'll push for time. No, that's fine. So obviously just following on from what James said, if you've done it online, why can't you submit it online? You have to go, um, print it out, and then there's actually, um, you don't get a receipt for that work. And um, the majority of uh, schools do now accept online submissions for essays and things, don't they? So you say the majority of schools, but that's not all schools. And I know, especially within my own school, I still have to print out work and take it in for submission. I have to. And I'm not saying, obviously, in my manifesto I've said abolish uh, the paper handing. I know this isn't feasible for every single subject, but I want to try and push it as far as possible, especially for sustainability. I worked for WWF for two, yeah, uh, for two summers, um, and it's something that I feel quite strongly about. Okay, that's great. Um, so we've got two audience questions, but as I said, we are really pushed for time. So, you know, jump in as and when you want to, but equally, please be brief. So we're going to we're going to limit it to like thirty seconds, I'm afraid. <laughs> would we would love to hear more um, about what you as candidates are meaning in promoting inclusivity and liberation at the university? Sorry about that. Um, yes, James. Go. Yeah, okay, so there are two points here that refer to inclusivity. The first one, of course, is one I mentioned at the very beginning, which is basically to promote Scottish languages. Now, of course, that is a taboo topic for certain people, but I think we have to remember that there are certain courses that happen to have, be about Scottish history and Scottish literature, and having a bit of Gaelic in there wouldn't be a bad thing, I don't think, in terms of basically being able to enrich the curriculum. And also, I mentioned... Oh, you're going to have to make this really quick. Very quickly, and also the conferences that I mentioned at the beginning, they are a fantastic platform. It shouldn't just also be about having a little talk, but getting students to be involved in research. We are undergraduates paying money for it, or not all of us are, but that's something we should be doing. Brilliant. Um, with the idea of inclusivity, uh, I, uh, we've actually got Diva in the audience here who uh, runs Liberate Ed. That's a fantastic um, scheme that works with, within schools to provide seminars and workshops, and it needs to be far more uh, publicised within schools and on the <coughs> emails and stuff. This is the sort of stuff we need to be doing, we need to be looking at, and course organisers have to be, um, you know, layers of it with okay. um, groups like Liberate Ed, with FEMSOP, people like that who are working with these issues directly. 
Brilliant. Okay, right. I'm going to move straight on to the next question. Um, so, this is your last question as well. Um, how would uh, you work with, excuse me, um, existing diversity societies to develop these ideas about LGBT and gender concerns um, in academia, um, especially men creating diverse curriculum for women, like non-LGBT, you know, how would you challenge these stereotypes within academia? Who's going to I feel like... Yeah, 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 sure. I, I, honestly, this is something I really want to work on this year. So when I mentioned STEM as well, especially having women in science is a big thing. And it's something that I was actually working this year with my own school to recognize women in science who played a huge contributional role. Um, it's something that I really want to push for in terms of, again, um, through the BME Liberation Group, women especially, um, LGBT+, and, the, um, and also disability. It's, a, I mean, we all really need to work on that, and it's something that I really want to push for this year. Okay, I'm really sorry guys, I am just going to have to end it there, we are out of time. Um, but thank you all very much, good luck, and well done. introductions and manifestos and then we'll get into some questions and hope we have some more questions from the audience. Um, sorry we are running a little bit late but hopefully it will be worth it. So, Hi, I'm Lexa, I'm Claire. and I'm Lexa, I'm Lexa, I'm Lexa. Um, I'm an anthropology and archaeology student in my fourth year um, and I decided to run for president um, because I've been this is like my moment to start up. I've been really inspired by the work of um, like the Students Association and the SAGs this year. And um, I thought it would be kind of cool to try and carry on some of the really good work they've done. Um, so for me, like my main campaign thing that you're going to see everywhere is make more noise. And I basically am trying to, um, like many people before me, but hopefully in a slightly different way, um, connect people more together at the university. So communication university-wide, so that's um, in the university and um, within USA and then um, in the wider world. Um, so from, personally, I haven't actually been involved with USA before, sorry, the student association, um, and I think that's partly because um, I never realised kind of what it does for us as students and how important it is. And so I am um, trying to kind of change that slightly by um, really publicising all of the work that they do, as well as um, creating like an online action space for people to get more involved in the workings of the Students Association. So um, students are within the association. Brilliant. Thanks, Beth. And... Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Patrick, and I'm going to be the president that works for you. And um, here's how. So you deserve a birthday present, so we're going to give you free entry to the Big Cheese on the week of your birthday. I also want to work with societies to provide free taster sessions to improve mental and physical well-being. I know that students on satellite campuses just aren't sport enough, so from ECA to Easter Bush to KB, I want to improve the number of counsellors, the quality and range of food available in shops, as well as keep the 41 bus free. I believe making the university accessible should be a priority, which is why I would fight to make special circumstances more accessible and introduce an online roadmap for course deadlines. Nobody should have to jump through hoops to get the help they need. I uh, sorry. I'm running because I want to leave Edinburgh a nicer, happier city than we found it. And I believe that we deserve a university that works for us, not just us working for them. Thank you. Great, okay. Thanks very much, guys. Um, we're going to go with some general questions, and hopefully they're quite nice and open, so you get to kind of expand on as many of your policies as possible. Um, we'll start this time with Patrick. Um, so, uh, what makes you a youth president? Um, I believe it's my dedication to sort of leaving the university better than I found it. When I first came here, I sort of fell in love with the city, but when I realised how unsupportive the university was and how let down all my friends and course mates felt by the university, 
I really wanted to get involved and make a difference. And I'm just so determined to make sure that everyone who comes after us has such a, be a so much better experience than we've had. And that's pretty and much it. the future. Exactly. Okay, and Beth, what about you? a punt here and say that maybe I'm not better than anyone else um, for president, but I'm a student and it's our association and I think it's all of our responsibilities to actually um, try and make a difference. If there's something that we don't like at the university, I think we should um, stand up and try and make a change and so that's kind of what I'm doing. I thought that um, running for president was a good place to start in um, just like altering those little gripes that I've had throughout my four years here. And um, yeah, that's my main motivation, is I want to empower everyone to also be able to make those changes if they want to. Okay, and we've got a question about your manifesto now, Beth. Um, because you say you want to create greater emphasis on campus regarding employability, and how you plan, but how do you plan, sorry, to integrate um, the career services more into university life? And even though it's your question, Beth, Feel free to jump in, you know, if you've got better ideas. But, sorry. Yeah, off you go. I am. But, prove me wrong. <laughs> um, so, so, for me, the career service is such an important resource at the university and they do really fantastic work. But um, I have a lot of friends and people that I've spoken to who um, just haven't ever really found the time or maybe the motivation to actually go in and talk to the career service. And yes, that's our fault, um, but to be honest, we if that's not working, we should try and again, make a change with that. So um, I thought that a good way to do that was trying to um, just get a dialogue going between schools and the career service so that um, we can incorporate it more into our like curriculum. So instead of just learning, which is, so much fun, we also um, can kind of begin to think about what we want to do once the learning finishes. Um, so it makes it a bit more applicable and a bit more personal. Yeah. So I mean, for instance, studying anthropology, I would really um, like to know what careers are available and I could definitely go to the career service, but there's also, um, you know, something to be said for having um, a lecture just on becoming an anthropologist or what you can do with your anthropology degree. <laughs> Don't be bored. Yeah. Well, you did a pretty good job of convincing me. So. Well, I, think, I, you know, I agree. I think, especially in Central, we're sort of kind of almost left to our own devices. And I know I have a friend who I believe is in the audience who um, went to the career service, and um, the person basically said, "Have you googled it?" And she said, "Yes." And she said, "Oh, well, I can't really help you." And that's not really good enough for me. And I think that the career service should be offering us a much more comprehensive infrastructure and pathways to finding jobs. I mean, I know at King's, for example, there are also, there are good sort of open days where businesses come in and there are but some of those around Central, but also I know that at ECA that a lot of students are just sort of left in the dark as to what to do after they finish university, and I think that's just completely unacceptable. So it's more about awareness. And I think also just investing in infrastructure for students to find pathways to get jobs at university, because I think we're all here because we want to find a good job after university, as well as learn more about the things that we love. So I think combining the two is important. Okay, um, that's excellent. Um, we've got uh, a question about your manifesto, um, but again, Beth, feel free to jump in if you want to. Um, what do you mean by subject-specific subsidies? And um, does that entail some kind of discrimination no, absolutely not. It doesn't entail discrimination at all. What it actually means is that for a lot of students, for example at the art school, they have to spend so much on just necessities for their projects. I used to know a lot of architects in first year who had to blow a third, half of their student finance just on being able to do their degree, whilst me as a central student who studies politics, I have to buy a book, maybe do some printing, and that's fine. It's about making sure it's a level playing field for everyone. Well, what about if you come from different income backgrounds? I mean, it might have been... No, but again, I, that's, no, that's, I think that's my point, which is that it's about making it a level playing field for everyone, so that if someone can't afford something, or it's impacting someone's standard of living by just trying to do the course they are here to do, they are able to have a firm and helping hand from the university. And how will you do that? 
I think it's about asking the university to put their hand in their pocket, because I believe for a while, the students have kind of been let down by the university. And I think it's about time the university lends a, a more reassuring, helping hand. Yes, and Beth, I mean, do you agree? Do you think that this is a really important issue? Um, yeah, I just, um, a small thing I wanted to say was that, like, for me, it's less about us and them. I think our university has to be about all of us together. Um, I don't think it's, it, it works, um, kind of blaming, um, the university for things they haven't done. I think it's us as students, we have a responsibility. If we want something to happen, we need to make it happen. And, Yes, there's all sorts of barriers in our way, and I completely appreciate that, but I think if we make more noise, um, then it's possible to make those changes that we want. Um, but, yeah, I do think that um, in terms of um, financing for our um, degrees, there does need to be more of like uh, a say in how much we have to spend because I mean for instance with I was just speaking to a geologist today and they have to do compulsory um, field work and they don't get any funding for that at all um, and only now are grants and stuff coming about um, and I think more needs to be done with things like this across all disciplines. Yeah. I, I think my point mainly was actually that just that I know that I think we all can agree that the universities know which courses they have on and they know, the university knows what they expect of students. And so they should, they should find a way to bridge that gap. I think it's just, for me it's simply about levelling the playing field to make sure that everyone has the same accessibility. Mm -hmm. But really, Barry, like just the organisation. Mm -hmm. Which is, sorry. Yeah, no, go for it. Um, so one of my key manifesto points is having um, greater um, control and communication in things like course content. So um, if you're not happy with what is on offer for your course, then actually being able to um, have that communication with your um, course organisers and telling them. Yeah, okay. Um, we're going to move on to another general question. Um, so again, feel free to comment on each other. Um, a problem that has been particularly identified on our campus is low student satisfaction. Um, the National Student Survey in 2016 ranked um, Edinburgh as 145th in the UK, I believe. So how would you target this problem and um, what would be your first action steps? Beth, we'll start with you. Sure. So um, in terms of um, improving communication, um, one of my main things that I mentioned earlier um, is having like an online space for contacting the Students Association on any issues you might have. So at the moment, as far as I understand it, though I'm sure um, there's people here who know far better than me, but as I understand it, you have to, if you have a problem um, that you want to raise, you have to contact the um, Student Council or you have to um, raise the issue with the student council and it's quite um, a lengthy process that um, you can only really do if you're properly committed to it. Um, so I kind of wanted to change that and make um, our contact with the Students Association reflect the connectivity and all But do you of think it's just a case of being able to communicate problems or is it actually having something done about them? Well I think the two go hand in hand so I think like the whole issue is um, just a few voices doesn't do anything kind of need everyone and um, so the idea of having like an online space where you have kind of like trending topics that are then raised at the student council and then are kind of um, furthered by the students association <laughs> is a good way to go. Um, yeah. Okay. Patrick, what would you do? Again, sort of, I think it sort of when I realised how awful the student satisfaction was at this university, it really, really was upsetting. So I mean, it, I think again, it just comes down to the university stepping up where it hasn't thus far. I mean, in my manifesto, I want to implement things like the online roadmap for course deadlines, so that you can implement a, a timetable that's tailored to you, but also so that you can see very clearly what you have to do. I want to make sure that exam timetables are released early so students don't have to fork out shed loads of money to get back home. I also want to hold open office hours. 
every single week across all of the campuses, which I think will really go far because it means that students' voices aren't only heard at elections and at councils, but it means they're heard throughout the year and problems can be put to sabbatical officers throughout the year so their voices are heard and the problems are resolved. Okay, and um, we're going to move on to another question. Um, so we'll start with you this time, Patrick. Um, how will you encourage student participation in the election? Um, particularly groups like postgrads or um, people who don't typically run for positions and people who aren't maybe typically as involved with you, sir? No, I mean, I completely agree. There are a lot of, I mean, the turnout is terrible, but I think it's about showing people what the Students' Association can do for them and also about doing things for those people. I think a lot of times those people are left out of politics, for example, postgrads, and a lot of the people who we rely on for our tutor system are currently, currently have the teaching cap, which means that they can't teach as many hours as they want and they have very finite deadlines. I think it's important to improve their standard of life as well. And I think that's the main thing, is, is making it relevant to them and it's showing them why it matters to them. And again, holding open office hours will prove exactly that and also implementing my online manifesto tracker will show people exactly how effective SABs can be and how important they can be in showing the people of this university have a better quality of life. Thank you. Beth, we can be quite quick because we've got one question from the audience, so, but yeah. Um, I think you were mentioning about online is really important, so um, again, I think that um, in terms of improving the turnout for the elections, putting more things online so um, hopefully you'll see my campaign that eventually it's going to be um, quite online because I think that that is, um, like it or not, the way that most of us communicate nowadays is there's a lot of online presence and I think that USA could do more with their online presence um, potentially. So for instance, um, releasing like video news of um, the work that they're doing so that it's kind of snappy and it's interesting rather than just emails as mentioned earlier in the debates. Um, I, emails don't necessarily work so well. Okay, um, so now we're going to go to our question from the audience. Um, so whoever wants to answer it first. Um, should university um, be seen as a means to an end for a job? Or do you think that it's um, more about the value of the education and the experience whilst you're here? What's I feel like maybe this has been slightly raised by my employability thing. Um, I think that, I mean, I've absolutely loved studying at university and I think it's just the best thing ever to be able to study all day, every day. I'm a nerd. Yeah. Um, but I think that, um, you know, that's fantastic and I think it's great that we have the space to do that but there's you know not all of us can study for the rest of our lives and we have to face facts of that and so I think by increasing employability that's not um, you know just seeing it as a means to an end I think that's listening to what students um, actually require which is most of us a job. Okay, Patrick, can you be really quick? I'll, yeah, I'll try. I think it should be both. If I'm very honest, um, I think the university should be. An, I think university should be an amazing experience for everyone, and I think that should lead to a job if you want it to. But also, if you just want to have a great time whilst you're here, you should be allowed to do that too. So I think it's mostly about making sure that people have the university experience that they want to have, rather than having a university experience that they're forced to have. Thank you. Very spooky. Okay. Wrap it up. Thank you both so so much. Um, please, everyone, remember to vote in the election. Now you've heard so much about it. Um, good luck to you both, and thank you.